so we've titled this uh, the redefining narratives on BRI debt and BRI development in Sri Lanka. So really, there are two big narratives that uh, we want to present some analysis to redefine. Uh, one is on debt, the other is on development. Uh, the debt narrative, overall, what we want to say is effectively, I think what the research is showing, and it's not different perhaps to what uh, Professor Barry uh, also suggested, that the narratives on both debt, which is a negative narrative, and the narrative on development, which is a positive narrative, both narratives might be overstated when you look at the data uh, and you dig into the details of how uh, BRI is being implemented uh, and experienced in countries such as Sri Lanka. Uh, I think this is the question that we have to grapple with and understand. So in talking about the overstatement of the debt narrative, I, I will present uh, analysis in two parts, the, the debt narrative on BRI loans, uh, but also the narrative on concessional financing. So even the debt narrative has a negative and positive side. One is that the debt is concessional uh, and therefore helpful. The other is that it's a debt trap. Okay. Uh, so let me begin on the, on the debt trap narrative, which I think is perhaps one of the most seriously overstated narratives. Uh, when my computer shows that my internet connection is unstable, I'll pause. Uh, but uh, what, some, what may be high wrong you could do is you could give me a hand signal because I can see you on my screen uh, if there's a problem in hearing me. Okay. Uh, so that, uh, fundamentally, even though China is presented uh, as the case study of debt trap, and this narrative, I think, has a lot of traction internationally, uh, for sure, in the Sri Lankan case, uh, it is very difficult to see China as involving Sri Lanka in a debt trap, uh, just based on the numbers. And I think that's what we want to present today. Uh, so we will analyze the question of a debt trap on two axes. One is the quantity of debt that Sri Lanka has to China. And second is the terms of debt uh, between Sri Lanka and China. So... On the quantity of debt, I think uh, what we find is China is not the major holder of Sri Lankan government debt. Uh, and, and we can't see China as the quantity of debt to China as the major debt problem for Sri Lanka. On the terms of debt, uh, we find that you know, servicing Chinese debt is also not the most difficult compared to the other debt that Sri Lanka has to service. Uh, and, and let me present some numbers to explain this. So effectively, um, I think what the numbers show us is that financial markets outstrip China in terms of the quantity of debt. Uh, let me show you some analysis around that. Uh, for instance, uh, what, you, what this graph shows you is the way debt has, uh, where the holders of government debt, and we are talking about now central government debt. Uh, the, the, sometimes national debt is held in different ways. We'll discuss that. Uh, and you can see that uh, Sri Lanka didn't hold much debt to China or much debt to uh, international financial markets. What's marked as ISB there are international sovereign bonds. So that those are effectively debt to international financial markets. Uh, uh, and, and if you reverse all the way back to 2000, or debt with international financial markets. Uh, but the comparison against 2000, so it's really in 2007 and 8 that the international financial market and Chinese debt began to be, come into the portfolio. Uh, and what you can see is the growth in debt even from 2009 to 2019 uh, is that uh, international debt to international financial markets have, have grown 24 times to reach 15.1 billion uh, and become 43% of Sri Lanka's uh, debt portfolio, that is in foreign debt portfolio, okay? Uh, I'm only looking at uh, external debt here, not at total debt, okay? Uh, Chinese debt has also grown quite a lot. It's grown, but, uh, you know, about half as, it's grown 13 times, 
Um, and the quantum is also only about one fourth at the end of the period. So Chinese debt is really only 10 percent, while, while debt to international financial markets is 43 uh, percent. And the growth rate of these two portfolios also show that it's international financial market debt that has been growing much faster than China. Of course, Chinese debt has been growing faster than other bilateral debt, uh, uh, for sure, and even other multilateral debt. So you can see that the proportion of other bilateral and other multilateral debt that Sri Lanka has had has come down from around 50% uh, to below 30%. Okay. Uh, so, and, and though 20% as well, when you look at uh, bilateral debt. So yes, China, Chinese debt is growing fast. It's growing fast compared to multilateral debt. It's growing fast compared to bilateral debt, uh, the bilateral debt. But I think when we enter the question of it's Sri Lanka in a debt trap and is, is China the source of that uh, debt trap, then the evidence uh, doesn't support that conclusion. Uh, it suggests that uh, international financial markets are far more challenging for Sri Lanka uh, than China in terms of debt obligation. Well, I think, uh, Carla, is it possible to turn off um, the video for Dr. Demel? Yes. yes. Is it okay to turn off your, your video? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, of course. Right. Yeah. Uh, because uh, my, my internet connection is not good enough. Okay. Uh, so what I've done is that I have added, um, uh, let me pause. Uh, okay. I've added the state-owned enterprise debt, and, and that is where, the st where debt is held not by the central government, but by companies that are owned, fully owned by the state. That does add some amount of debt uh, uh, on the China debt portfolio, it's actually quite substantially. It adds more than 50% uh, to the debt portfolio. Uh, but still, you can see that the total quantum of debt that China holds uh, is uh, only one third of the debt portfolio, about one third of what is held by international financial markets. Uh, now, this graph just is a way to capture uh, how the debt uh, has increased over time. Okay, uh, let me play it. It shows how uh, Sri Lanka's debt holders have changed uh, from 2000 onwards. So it's a running graph uh, that shows you the amount of debt, uh, central government debt held by different people. And you can see after 2007, China and its international sovereign bonds have become large debt holders and international sovereign bonds quickly overtake uh, everyone else. While well, China also moves up this ladder quite uh, fast, but still the total China debt still remains behind uh, ADB and Japan. Okay, so that gives you a picture. So it's not to say that China debt is not significant. Uh, it's certainly significant in terms of how fast it's grown. Uh, but I think uh, it does suggest that the debt trap narrative uh, is probably focused in the wrong direction uh, and that Sri Lanka should be far more concerned about how it's managing its debt to international financial markets uh, uh, in terms of relative difficulty uh, and quantum of debt that Sri Lanka has. Uh, let me uh, see if I, I'm going to just get out of this. Um, I think I'm... Is my slides, are my slides moving for you or they're not moving? Uh, it's not moving. Not moving. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for two seconds and share back so that it will, it, it will move again. Uh, so let's come to the terms of debt. Uh, I, I think you can see this slide now, okay? Um, so, uh, so financial markets, uh, I think I'm having some, okay, right. So uh, the, I think e, not just on the quantum of debt, but even on the terms of the debt, uh, what we find is that uh, China debt is perhaps easier for Sri Lanka to manage uh, than 
subject to international financial markets. So, so that's important. And if you do the numbers on that, what you can see is that average interest rates on uh, debt to international financial markets is about 6.6%, uh, taking it on dollar denominated terms. So all the debt we have converted here uh, to dollar equivalent. So if there was an appreciation of the currency against the dollar, then we add it back as an interest rate, okay? So that we make it uh, really neutral on the currency uh, because otherwise you may find that you have debt to some, say Japan can look uh, quite low in interest rates. It's much lower in yen, but it's higher when you take the dollar denominated uh, value that you pay back. And Sri Lanka holds its reserves in dollars. The so dollar is the best rate at which to calculate the debt. But the cost of China debt uh, against, you know, it's higher uh, than it is to Japan, to World Bank, uh, to other multilaterals and bilaterals, uh, to ADB, India. Uh, but it's significantly lower than to financial markets. That's what the first uh, left-hand side shows you. Uh, and when you look at maturity periods, because debt also, a short mature debt has to be recycled. And recycling debt can be expensive and difficult and, and lead to tensions and instability. And we see the maturity period, the weighted average uh, length of maturity of Chinese debt is around 18 years. Uh, and rounding it off, so it is really 17 point something. And Mm, we lost his voice. Um, Brief of the cycles overall. Uh, and they are more expensive compared to Chinese debt. So if, if you're looking at this from the perspective of Sri Lanka, I think it would be important to understand that uh, China debt from China is not as concessional uh, Debt from China is not as concessional as debt from maybe some of the other multilaterals and historical multilaterals and bilaterals who, you know, arguably come in to provide Sri Lanka with concessional debt. Sri Lanka was a poorer country, but it doesn't mean that they're providing debt at the same reduced rates anymore. Uh, so on the margin, when the choice is between borrowing international financial markets and borrowing from China, there seems to be a be, be an advantage for Sri Lanka to borrow from China uh, than to borrow from international financial markets. Uh, and I think uh, that is an important, uh, important aspect to understand when evaluating Sri Lanka's debt options. Uh, however, uh, I think there is also a narrative uh, that talks about the concessionality of Chinese debt. Uh, and, and we just showed that the concessionality, uh, the interest rates are 3.3%. Uh, that's a low rate. Uh, the narrative on concessionality, though, needs to be also examined a little bit carefully. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, Hairong, can you tell me how much more time I have right now? Yeah. Um, you still have... Um, yeah. You yeah, I think 10 minutes, a, maybe? Yeah, yeah. 10 minutes also. Okay, so let's look at the concessionality question. You know, China debt, uh, you know, it turns out that China debt is not as co concessional as competing debt holders. Uh, and there's also hidden cost of concessional debt overall, and, and Chinese debt also have that hidden cost, which is actually what we call tied procurement. That is where you ask the person that's receiving the debt, uh, you restrict their procurement choices to the debt holder. Uh, and, and many countries do it. China is not alone. Um, most bilaterals ask that you purchase uh, you know, project implementation requirements from the country that is giving you the loan. But of course, that can significantly reverse the concessionality of the loan that you take. So... So overall, I mean, of course, Chinese debt is concessional. This is basically we are calculating what you call the grant element of loans. And there is an there is internationally accepted way to calculate a grant element and classify loans as concessional. And uh, when you do the present discounted value against your alternative options, internationally, they use 6%. We use a slightly higher rate because Sri Lanka borrows at about 6.5% at least at that over, the, over history or from ISBs. 
you, uh, when you look at the the present discounted value of the of the loan payment repayment against the nominal value of the loan, uh, if you had borrowed it, say, on the international financial markets, uh, you can calculate the grant element, right? Uh, and, and this is what we've done here. Uh, we've assessed not just China, but uh, 50 loans. Um, 18 of them were from China. Uh, and 13 of the loans from, uh, the 18 loans from China had a grant element of just above 35%. So they actually get classified uh, potentially. Uh, Verite is, of course, using uh, a slightly more generous benchmark to calculate grant element. Uh, and then 13 of China's loans just qualify uh, of the 18 uh, as meeting the constitutionality uh, benchmark uh, of being a 35% grant element. The average grant element is a little lower when you add the other loans. It's about 35%. Uh, now, you can see that the average grant element on loans from China are not as high as the bilaterals um, uh, and multilateral lenders. Uh, but overall, uh, given that Sri Lanka's outside option may be to go to international financial markets, a grant element of 31% is clearly of value to Sri Lanka uh, in deciding how to borrow. However, concessionality can easily be reversed by tight procurement. That is, if you all tell a country that's receiving a concessional loan, you've got to purchase from uh, without competitive bidding, uh, it effectively means that there is a high risk of cost escalation. So that cost escalation really comes back as a hidden interest rate or hidden interest cost uh, on what is otherwise looks like a, a loan that is at a concessional interest rate. And the loan can sometimes end up being not just non-concessional or, or less concessional, but even adverse. So if the, if the tide elements are high and cost escalations are high, loan, um, what looks like a concessional bilateral loan can actually end up being worse overall for the borrowing party than going to international financial markets. And that's the analysis we've done here, right? Uh, we've looked at uh, 50 high value loans uh, taken from 2005 to 2018, 15 multilateral loans, 35 bilateral loans. Uh, these are the values on the left-hand side. Uh, we've looked at the grant element and tried to say, well, what is the cost escalation uh, under which given the tied element of the loan, the grant element would be entirely reversed and brought to zero. So what you can see is that for uh, Japanese loans, actually you'd have to have a 251 or 250% uh, cost escalation uh, to have the grant element negated. Uh, even the, the, the Japanese loan that is it's sort of with the highest tied element has 119% cost escalation to negate the grant element. When you get to China, you can some loans um, where a 4% cost escalation due to the on the tied procurement can completely negate the uh, grant element. Uh, and, and for many of the Chinese loans, a 30, 35 to 40% uh, cost escalation uh, would completely negate the grant element. Uh, so that is a high risk because when you look at Sri Lanka's infrastructure building, uh, one of the complaints done through research from Sri Lankan university professors, uh, it's not our own and it's published in newspapers. Uh, I'm going to pause a little whenever my internet connect shows it's unstable. Uh, so, so research that's in the public domain uh, suggests that cost escalation on infrastructure projects uh, have been in the order of more than 50%. Okay, so, so and, and they are looking mainly at projects uh, funded with Chinese loans. Uh, so there is a, there is a high risk and, and high the probability that grant elements on loans from China could have been completely reversed. Uh, by the cost escalation of tied procurement. And this is mainly because China has a very high level of tied procurement. Uh, so if you look at this on average, Chinese loans have a 99% tied procurement. That is of the loan quantity, 99% is tied uh, on average to procurement from China. Actually 14 loans have a procurement of 100% or more sometimes. So sometimes there's a, a part that is put in by the Sri Lankan government, not, not part of the loan, but even that is tied to procurement from China. Uh, so 
so there is only one loan that didn't have a procure uh, tide element of 100%, that had a tide element of 76%, uh, which is what got us 99%. So uh, what this suggests is that the way in which China uh, delivers the loan carries a very high tide element that can uh, actually quite uh, substantially reverse the benefits of the grant element. And if the cost escalation is uh, between over, over, over 45%, uh, for most of these loans, then the grant element could be completely reversed and the loan could even become adverse. And that's a very serious uh, problem. All this is contained uh, in a document called Financing Infrastructure, the Non-Concessionality of Concessional Loans, produced by Verity Research. Uh, I must say I'm not presenting research done just by myself. Uh, this is uh, Subhash Yabe Singer, who has... Uh, who leads our, our trade uh, research portfolio, uh, it's very closely with Chinese scholars, uh, has spent time in Beijing, uh, is also very significantly a part of this research analysis as uh, uh, Matish Arangala and other researchers at Verite. So this is a collective uh, effort of academics at Verite, uh, and this is available for you to just download from our website um, and read anytime. Uh, to, to get more details that I haven't covered. I know my time is up, so let me be brief uh, on this thing, uh, on, the develop, on redefining the development narrative. Um, I think uh, we, the development narrative uh, has two components. It's the non-interference and democracy narrative uh, on one hand, and it is the other, on the other hand, it is the narrative of benefit and, and, and welfare to society. I think both these narratives uh, perhaps are also overstated and, and we need to understand why and I'll quickly run through some slides. Um, uh, you know, I, I just mentioned that 99% of the loans that, uh, and, uh, that, um, that Sri Lanka took from China had a tied element of, you know, 99% tied element of Chinese loans. Uh, there were 18 loans we analyzed, and actually 12 of these loans originate as unsolicited proposals. So this concept that a government, uh, you know, that, that the projects are all initiated and accepted by a government and, and, and society and democracy may be overstated. Uh, because unsolicited proposals in Sri Lanka, when you analyze, I mean, not just loans from China, from all other kinds of projects that are implemented, unsolicited proposals are the highest risk of being high cost uh, and high level of um, governance problem, malgovernance associated with them, uh, corruption, lack of due diligence, etc. Uh, that is when the government doesn't self-initiate the idea and interest in, in, in implementing a proposal. Uh, and the proposals come as unsolicited, they come from a third party, and somehow there's somehow high level buy-in is engineered in some fashion uh, at cabinet level. So it doesn't really come through the normal governance and planning system. So, you know, two thirds of the Chinese loans uh, to Sri Lanka uh, actually originate as unsolicited proposals. And I think that's something China may want to think again about, you know, does it really want to initiate unsolicited proposals? Uh, because uh, because those can lead to significant uh, um, other Indonesia also talked about it. They can lead to I, I think one person mentioned white elephant infrastructure, uh, and and Sri Lanka has you know an airport that is uh, that is described as the loneliest airport in the world, uh, or the most empty airport in the world, built as an unsolicited proposal that came from China. Um, and, and there have been controversies around, you know, even the Hambant report that was not built with proper feasibility, proper analysis uh, for the business case. Uh, of course, China rescued Sri Lanka in that case by making an investment and, and, and taking the port on a 99 years lease. I don't subscribe to the idea that that was an uh, example of a trap uh, uh, because Sri Lanka was not obliged to sell Hambant the port to China. It could have sold it to any country in the world. It was only China that was willing to take the port and try to make that investment successful. Uh, but originally, the reason that that port was unsuccessful really was that, you know, there is this proposal that comes in, 
to expand the port without proper due diligence and feasibility. And there are a lot of poor governance. So I think this idea that China is simply, uh, simply you know, following uh, the democratic interests of a society uh, may be, I think, overstated. Because what you find is that with unsolicited proposal, governments are able to implement uh, projects that are have a high interest to, to, to particular actors within government, but not necessarily to society and, and are not in the long and don't have proper evaluation on the financial returns over the long term. Uh, and that is really the democratic uh, problem uh, and the governance problem, uh, which needs to be grappled with. So over history, you know, ADB and multilateral donors have grappled with this problem and put due diligence in place to make sure that their loans are not abused by, by government because of the, also because the lack of transparency. Now, if you look at this, the procurement methods uh, uh, for these loans and, and the terms and conditions. Now for the Japanese loans, for the ADB loans, World Bank loans, we could get them online. Chinese and Indian loans, we simply could not get them online. Luckily, Sri Lanka now has a RTI law uh, right to information, and, and that is the only thing that enabled us to get the details. Otherwise, government actually de- implements this proposal in secret uh, and doesn't allow society to understand the terms and conditions and the contract that it is getting into. And, 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 and other countries that have a long experience in lending in a constructive way have found ways to make that information more open to society, support democracy in that way. And this might be something that China also can learn over time to do better uh, because that, that is not something that's happening enough with Chinese loans at the moment. And this is an aid transparency index done by... Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to ask you to wrap up. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, so this shows that aid transparency may not be very high in, in many. And let me gen- just end with the last slide. Okay. So I, I'm sorry for going over time. I think that China BRI has a very high goal of being a win-win scenario, right? Uh, that Chinese loan should lead not only to China expanding uh, its influence and contribution in the world, but also that the societies that receive that funding succeeding. Uh, but not con- being concerned enough about good governance. Uh, about democracy, about feasibility, about outcomes uh, can result in Chinese loans uh, actually going from being a win-win to a lose-lose. Okay. So we are saying if there is transparency, if proper feasibility is ensured, environments compliance is ensured, uh, long-term returns and the evaluations are in place, which will of course slow down the disbursement of loans, you have a win-win scenario. But what, what we are seeing in Sri Lanka is there's a significant um, disenchantment building in society with regard to Chinese loans. The coal power plant that China funded has been constantly breaking down. Uh, there is no good build operate transfer that keeps it successful. The pollution levels have been too high. Uh, this is not the fault of China necessarily, but it's the way projects are implemented and handed over that then makes society feel that China has acted in a way that is not beneficial overall to the country. So unfortunately, this is not even in China's interest, right? Because, because the short-term win-win can become a longer, medium-term lose-lose uh, when the recipient countries and societies begin to uh, complain about these projects and their benefits to the country. So, uh, so the, uh, let me end there to say that overall, this this uh, this positioning of China as putting Sri Lanka in a debt trap is inaccurate. It just does not hold up to the analysis on data. Uh, but the claim of concessionality of Chinese loans is also overstated. The concessionality can be substantially reversed by tied procurement terms. Uh, but even more than the tied procurement terms, the unsolicited proposals, the lack of due diligence in the implementation of uh, BRI-funded projects, uh, which are facilitated by the way the projects are financing is given, can actually allow poor governance to have too much impact, negative impact, ending in a lose-lose scenario for both China and Sri Lanka, rather than the win-win scenario that is anticipated by BRI. And these are lessons we must take into consideration in improving the way BRI functions, both in Sri Lanka and, and in the rest of the world. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tamel. Now the floor is open for questions. We only have a few minutes, <laughs> about five minutes uh, for questions. Um, right, uh, I see no questions from Q&A and I have two questions myself. Yes. And then there is also a question from Zhang Hong, I think. Um, my two questions are, um, the first one is, um, I want to hear what you think about this argument. Uh, Japanese loan to Sri Lanka, um, as you indicated, the interest rate is 0.7%, which is very low. Uh, however, it's denominated in Japanese yen. And given that the Japanese yen vis-a-vis -vis dollar has really changed over a period of, long period of time, uh, that had actually resulted in much more financial burden for, for Sri Lanka, uh, perhaps several times more than what has been earlier expected. So would that also, of course, uh, would that um, cancel out the concessional uh, aspect of Japanese loan? So that's one question. And the second yes. question I have is about uh, Thai procurement, cancel out um, the concessional aspect as well. So in the case of Chinese loans, this is also related to our research in Africa. Uh, we found indeed a lot of the Chinese uh, finance projects are tied to Chinese companies. However, because the uh, overall budget of um, Chinese uh, projects have been uh, relatively lower than say other bidders, um, so the tight loan does not seem to matter uh, very much in terms of canceling out the concessional aspect of the loans uh, on the condition that the Chinese um, projects do not cost as much as uh, um, other um, actors. So, so what do you think of this? Um, does tight loan, uh, tight procurement necessarily cancel out the concessional aspect of loans or it's based on certain conditions? Uh, so let me answer the second question first. I think whether the tight, tight loans um, increase the cost or not is a question that uh, it can't be decisively answered. But I think if you look at the cost of infrastructure building uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, roads especially, now that research is not, us, not from us, but one of our most, uh, the best engineering university in Sri Lanka uh, has, uh, has published, uh, professors there have published articles that show that China, the cost escalation on infrastructure built by Chinese loans have been faster uh, and, and greater, and the cost escalations have been in the multiple of two to three times over about uh, five, six, or uh, seven years. And also that uh, the average cost of building roads in Sri Lanka have turned out to be greater than it is in the EU and other places where costs are actually higher. So there are indications that I can't uh, verify from our own research uh, that there is indeed very high cost escalation uh, on tide procurement uh, from all countries. I mean, this is not unique to China. Please uh, don't think that Indian loans have also been identified as having very high cost escalation on tide procurement. Uh, so these two loans seem to be vulnerable uh, because uh, it really weaknesses on the Sri Lankan government side. Right, uh, that Sri Lanka government doesn't benchmark uh, procurement when they are tied procurement, and we even have laws that allow to bypass uh, normal controls. Uh, so Sri Lankan, so this is why the democracy problem exists. Our laws are written to bypass procurement controls and due diligence when there is a, when it's a bilateral funding. Uh, and, and that is a very unfortunate aspect. I, I didn't have time to show you those laws, but uh, we, we have them and they're in the electricity sector, they're in the infrastructure sector. Uh, so I would say the answer to the first one is, yes, there is significant evidence of cost escalation, unfortunately, uh, even on, uh, on loans that are procured from China, as well as other bilateral loans, uh, uh, including India and Japan, right, for sure. But, but Chinese loans then cross that threshold quite quickly because of the high level of that. On your first question on Japanese loans, let me share your screen. On a, We have a, a fact-checking platform uh, on which we have fact-checked that precise question um, as to whether, uh, and you can see my screen, whether Japanese loans are the cheapest. So actually, we did the adjustment uh, for the dollar denomination. 
Uh, and after doing all that also, uh, and you can go to a factcheck.lk and, and, and look it up, uh, Japanese loans are really quite easily identifiable as the cheapest uh, terms that Sri Lanka can get. So even when the yen one is not adjusted, we've done it with the depreciation adjustment and the repayments. Uh, and, it is, uh, and it is by far uh, the better term. So Sri Lanka certainly has had, I think, uh, more favorable loans from Japan than any other bilateral lender or even any other multilateral lender for that matter. Uh, so that story remains fairly robust uh, and, and easily established. Thank okay. you for asking.